Okay, all set? You can hear me fine? All right, awesome. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sartaj Karaman. I'll kind of tell you a few things that, you know, we've been doing at MIT around autonomous drones. We had initially planned like a bit of a demonstration here, but that's not going to happen. I'll just show you some videos and we'll kind of get through that. If you have any questions in the beginning, at the end, in the middle, uh, send an email. Uh, my email is my first name at MIT.edu, at C-R-T-A-T, at MIT.edu. Um, I always kind of start out kind of saying that, you know, typically when we think about drones today, uh, these are the kinds of things that in the defense department, kind of, these are the kinds of things in the defense department people are really used to and people have been using. Um, so we still have these things operational. Now you've seen in this expo that there's much smaller vehicles and they're more interesting and you can use them in a variety of aspects. And it's all very exciting. But I would say that if you go to smaller vehicles that you can hold in your hand, there's some amazing things technically you could do with them. Human pilots fly these drones in a setting called the first person view, FPV. Now people are very familiar with it in the defense domain. I'll show you a couple of videos of human flights. So this is human piloted of a small drone. So if you're typically now, everybody's familiar with FPV drones in the circles at this point, but what, how, how this works is that this kind of a camera image is beamed back to a set of goggles worn by a human who is joysticking this thing around. So that's kind of the idea. Um, as you can see, it's just very impressive. Amazing things that this human pilot is doing. We're very far away still being able to do these things completely autonomously. And this is a bit of a fun case, but you know, you can do these things in much more relevant environments. Um, like imagine missions of like search and rescue, personnel recovery, or a variety of defense missions in these types of environments. Humans can pilot them pretty well at high speeds, reaching 70, 80, sometimes 100 miles an hour, 10 feet off the front, uh, off the ground. We've been working on similar technologies at MIT. We kind of started calling them autonomous super vehicles. The idea would be to fly them as fast as humans can fly them and maybe even faster. One of the quick things that we realize as we work on this kind of technology is that um, off-the-shelf hardware, specifically off-the-shelf compute, I don't think is enough to really scale this kind of technology. What I mean by that is that you really need a tight integration between sensors, computers, and algorithms to push the boundaries of performance. And so what we've been doing is to design sensors, computers, and algorithms together from the ground up to enable these. What does that mean? Uh, for example, that means that we would design a chip um, and get it fabbed in, you know, typical foundries, they're fabbed in Intel and PSMC foundry, specifically for this purpose, so that we can reach the performance that we're targeting and not use something like a CPU or a GPU alone, but sort of build like a bit of a compute stack. Same thing with the sensors. You know, typical cameras are built for your eyes, so, you know, they capture at like 60 frames a second. You know, it's really great, but you can do a lot more in specialized sensors. So we've been investing a lot on sort of building compute and CMOS sensors and glue them together so that we can really process these things fast. And I'll just kind of mention that this is not very central to technology, but we've been also kind of building the vehicles around these kinds of compute stacks so that we can really pack the vehicles extremely well to get kind of good performance out. And these are some of the things that we can do fully autonomously without using any kind of aids within the lab. Um, so this is an autonomous kind of control, autonomous, fully autonomous flight of the vehicle. Um, it uses two cameras, a stereo camera, an initial measurement unit to go out, um, fly this kind of obstacle course. Um, what it's doing ultimately is that as it's going through, you'll see it's kind of going through one gate, another gate, a third gate, turn around, pass through the same gate the other way, and now we need to pass the last gate backwards. So it actually realizes that the fastest way to do it is to do a backflip as opposed to trying to turn around. That's a lot better in terms of measurement of sort of management of your inertia. So we realized that the way this kind of works is that there's a bit of a module that actually looks out from the camera, tracks the environment in order to understand where the vehicle is without having access to GPS. And then a stereo camera module using like sort of typical machine learning techniques detects the gate as it comes across. And then it basically has very precise controllers to kind of pass through the gate. There's a lot of other sensing happening in the vehicle that I kind of didn't mention, like for example, we have optical odometry on the motors so that we can sense how fast they're turning as precisely as possible so that we can really 
have super tight control of the drum. So those are some of the things that are happening in the background. And so you can see that like this is actually pretty fast. We try to build vehicles that are autonomous to track them. And from trying to follow the vehicle, you can see it's pretty fast. It's reaching, you know, about 30 miles an hour in a, in a space about this large. And you've seen a backflip there. The backflip is actually pretty quick. It looks like this. But the kind of cameras that we place on the vehicles capture about 300 frames a second. So that is, you know, like your eyes capture at up to 60 frames a second. Typically, you'll be seeing like 30 frames a second, 35 frames a second, 35 images every second your eyes capture. In fact, you know, like the kind of semi-autonomous car technology today typically uses 36 frames a second. It's very typical to kind of get that in the consumer drone kind of industry. This has 10 times that. So one way to think about how this drone operates is that it's seeing the environment in 10x slow motion. What you've seen as a quick backflip actually looks pretty slow to this drone. Things are not moving that fast. It's able to see things um, in a slow, sort of like a 10x slow motion. And then it's able to compute everything. And for this particular drone, even though it looks very kind of fast and quick to you, to the drone, it's actually a pretty still environment. This is maybe one way to imagine it. We're very used to sort of these, when I say drones, people are used to quadcopters or propellers looking up. That's not the only technology. It's not even the most efficient technology unless all you want to do is hover. If you want to go from point A to B, you can use fixed wing vehicles and they can go a lot further, much more efficiently. The problem with fixed wing vehicles is they're very hard to pilot. So people have been, haven't been using them. That's why we start out with quadcopters. But I would say that we also take fixed wing vehicles and we can do the same thing with fixed wing vehicles. So we can um, put them on a VTOL configuration. All you need is two propellers and some control surfaces. You can hover them. You can transition them to forward flight. You want to do backflips with them? You can do backflips with them. No problem. These are all technologically possible, you know, and we can demonstrate them in these lab environments. So now going forward, what I'm really excited about is to take this out of the lab environment especially at the age of AI. So what we've been doing is to go out and digitize all kinds of environments that we can find at utmost quality. This is a new revolution that just happened in computer graphics. They call them inverse graphics. You can scan this place with your like phone nowadays and create a very realistic digital replica. We've been doing this to create hundreds of digital replicas. So this is, for example, the basement of our building where our research lab at MIT is located. This is not a photo, but this is a rendering from our digital replica. You can see how much detail there is in the entire digital replica. These are some pictures from the first floor. It looks like a weird building. It's like a Frank Gehry designed building. It looks a bit weird. I'll kind of maybe, um, yeah, these are some pictures. I, I, I won't kind of play the video just yet. But so then what we do is, we use this as a training environment, and then we can have the vehicle learn how to fly in these environments. And we have so many of them, and the goal is to zero-shot transfer that to an actual environment that's kind of representative. We're trying indoor environments. That's because, you know, we have access to them. They're easy to kind of digitize. But I'm more excited about outdoor environments, actually, which you can digitize from airplane. Like, you can do some flyovers and get a digital replica that is accurate to, like, 10 centimeters, maybe even less. You can even digitize them from satellite imagery. So now what we do, so this is kind of like the environment that we kind of developed. Um, this is, as I said earlier, it's not a video, but it's kind of like a rendering of our digital replica. I should note that this rendering happens in a, in a pretty powerful computer. So this is not the kind of thing that you can get on your gaming console just yet. But you know, my, my guess is that wait like another few years, this is what video games are going to look like. So what we do, for example, is in the later stages of training, we actually fly the drone in an environment like this that you've seen before. Um, but then what we do is that we don't present this environment to the drone's computer, but we instead get the position and orientation of the drone from a motion capture in real time using a supercomputer, render the previous digital replica and give that to the drone. So the drone flies in another environment but it thinks that it's flying here. And so this is, a, this is a bit of a virtual reality for drones where the inertial measurements and the dynamics are real, but everything else that is ectoreceptive looking out, cameras, LIDARs, radars, it's all simulated. 
So we can kind of test the drone, almost like stress test, uh, everything except the actual environment and be able to transition. Recently, we've been looking at other propulsion technologies to go even faster and further. So we're thinking, can we put like a kilohertz camera on a vehicle and maybe have like custom chips to process that? Then we start to build vehicles that are like jet propelled. You know, we can take with a solid rocket motor, a vehicle up to like, you know, Mach 0.5, so half a Mach, uh, so three, 400 miles an hour for about 20, 25 seconds. Uh, you know, you would cover several miles in a short amount of time. That takes about me to kind of finish the sentence. Um, and you would need about a kilohertz camera in order so that you can fly about 20 feet off the ground and three, 400 miles an hour. And so these are technologies that are now possible. In between, we just started playing around with like this just jets vehicles. So, um, so these are sort of like one wing, one meter wingspan jet aircraft. Um, there's the jet turbine. It's the same exact thing as the aircraft that you probably flew to get here, uh, but it's just kind of fits in your palm. And these are kinds of vehicles that you can build a propulsion for like less than five thousand dollars. Um, and the autonomy for them, this kind of intelligent autonomy, is I think really dependent upon sort of not the kind of the propulsion technology and so on, but just basically who can design and build the chips and the autonomy algorithms together. I should say that it's not only just the kind of the fast and agile, but there's another regime where you can really make things small. And there's another area where you have to really fab the chips from the ground up, because this is not a place where, say, you can't take a beefy GPU or a CPU and put it into a small vehicle. Examples are, you know, we can build flapping wing vehicles that can fit on your fingernail. Um, if you can put a camera and IMU on it and maybe a small chip, you could make it autonomous. It would just, to your eye, at a distance more than a meter away, it would look like an insect that's just kind of like flying around. You can make satellites that are kind of an inch by inch in size, so half the size of a credit card it will be impossible to see them from Earth. There is no, because of the interference with the atmosphere, there is no telescope you can build, no matter how you build it. Like if you could build a kilometer telescope, you still wouldn't be able to see such a small object in space. So this could be used for, for example, like being able to surveil the space um, or other types of intelligence missions. Uh, you could put, not to mention, you could put in millions of them all at the same time in space in just one go. And there's other vehicles like balloons and things like that that became popular last year. These are some of the examples. So we can take the same chip designs that we work for very fast vehicles, but fab them for small size and low energy. So this is, for example, our GPS denied nav chip, where it finds the position of a vehicle using camera and IMU using only 20 milliwatts of power. So that's not watts of power, but that's just 20 milliwatts of power. Um, here in the figure, what you're seeing is, you know, we're kind of taking a camera and a chip and an IMU combination out in like an industrial looking like environment. And you can see two lines, green and blue. Uh, one of them is ground truth from motion capture. The other one is our estimate. Typical estimates will be about like, you know, half a percent off. Um, so because there's no aids of like GPS, it kind of has like a constant drift, but that drift is about 0.1% to half a percent. So, you know, if you go out with this kind of technology a kilometer, you'll be a few meters off. So it's pretty, um, you know, pretty good accuracy. You can, of course, put that on like a small drone, but you can imagine that once that's uh, small, you can put that on somebody's helmet. They can run around in a cave and you could just map the entire cave and get them back if they're lost, for example. Um, so these are some of the technologies that we're really excited about at the intersection of, I would say, sort of AI, uh, chip design and autonomy. I'm personally very excited about these things um, in any industry, uh, but I'm especially interested and excited about aerospace and defense. I personally think that this whole new revolution in kind of large-scale models or models trained with large-scale data will be very impactful, especially in the form of autonomy in defense applications. Um, I think that one day we may look back and just kind of put them in the same bucket as some of the major innovations within the defense industry. And it's very interesting, as we're seeing in the conference here, that all of this emergence of AI comes in the backdrop of like a seismic shift within the, within the world affairs. So it's a pretty interesting world that, you know, we're kind of looking at. 
And we think that sort of this AI chips and autonomy will be one of the bigger enablers in this. I'm out of time. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take it here. You're welcome to email me. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks a lot.